So the term in Pali is Oram Bhagya Sanyojana. The word Sanyojana is what we usually translate as fetter. It's actually connected. It's, the word is composed of the prefix san, which means together, and yojana, which means 
It's actually closely connected to the English word yoke, yoking, yoking together. So the samyojanas are particular mental factors, mental qualities, which yoke us or bind us to what's called the cycle of birth and death, samsara. And then the classical list contains ten samyojanas, ten fetters, and then these are divided into two sets. There are the five lower fetters, those are the five orambhagya samyojana, and then the five higher fetters, those are the five uddhambhagya samyojana. So the lower fetters, those are the fetters that bind us well, within the realm of rebirths, or the different realms of existence. Buddhism distinguishes three realms of existence. Maybe I don't have to write this. We have the desire realm, which is the realm that includes the lower worlds, the hell realm, the animal realm, the realm of tormented spirits, as well as the better types of, of existence, the human realm, and then the heavenly realms in which desire predominates. But then beyond the heavens of the desire realm, there is what is called the form realm, which is the realm of, there's just subtle matter remains there. But the beings there usually dwell in deep meditation. These are the states of that correspond to the jhanas, so that those who master the jhanas in the human world can be reborn in the form realm, where they exist, have extremely long lifespans, and spend most of their time immersed in deep meditation. And then beyond the form realm is another realm, which is called the formless realm. These are realms of existence in which there's no longer any physical body. It's just pure consciousness, pure states of, the beings consist of pure states of consciousness. And also they spend most of their time immersed in deep meditative absorption. But all of these realms are still realms within the cycle of birth and death. And so beings who get reborn in these higher realms will pass away when their karma is exhausted and take rebirth in other realms. And so even the form realm and the formless realm are not considered states of liberation. Okay, now the five lower fetters, those are the fetters that tie us to the desire realm. So it's because of these lower fetters that beings tend to take rebirth in the different plane, planes of existence in the desire realm. Whether a human being, a deity, a hungry ghost, or even an animal or a hell being, all are caused by these five lower fetters. And so the, it's possible to eliminate the five lower fetters, but still have the five higher fetters. And if one has the five higher fetters, then one can re, be reborn in the form realm and the formless realm, but one won't be reborn anymore in the desire realm. Okay, so now the Buddha is asking the monks to enumerate or to explain the five <coughs> lower fetters. And so now the monk Malakiputta speaks up and says that he knows the five lower fetters as taught by the Blessed One. 
Then the Buddha asked them, how do you remember the five lower fetters as taught by me? And then Malankya Putta answers, I remember identity, first I'll just read the passage and I'll explain them one by one. I remember identity view as a lower fetter taught by the Blessed One. I remember doubt, I remember adherence or say clinging to rules and observances as a lower fetter. I remember sensual desire as a lower fetter. I remember ill will as a lower fetter taught by the Blessed One. It is in this way that I remember the five lower fetters as taught by the Blessed One. Okay, so here we have the five lower fetters mentioned. And the first of these, which is here translated identity view, is called in Pali Sakkaya Ditti. This is the view of a self existing in relation to the five aggregates. I've gone through, I've, in previous classes, we've discussed Sakaya Ditti. So usually 20 kinds of identity view are enumerated in the text. We don't have to go through all of them, but basically the 20 are obtained by positing the self in different ways in relation to the five aggregates. And these can all be reduced simply to taking the self to be identical with one or another of the five aggregates, or else seeing the self to be separate from the five aggregates, but in some relation to them. So through this Sakaya Ditti, one establishes some kind or a sense of personal identity. This is what I am. This is my true nature. This is my real self. And all of these views are undercut by the attainment of the first stage of awakening, first stage of enlightenment, the stage of stream entry when one sees into the truth of the selflessness of all phenomena. And when one sees the selfless nature of all phenomena, then all views of self, of a substantial self, are eliminated. Okay, then doubt here really means, it doesn't mean just doubt in a general sense, but it means doubt about the enlightenment of the Buddha, doubt about the truth of his teaching, doubt whether there are people who have, by practicing the path, have realized the truth of his teaching. And so one who has seen the truth of the Dhamma eliminates doubt. It's just like, if I tell you that I'm holding a magic marker in my hand, now you can have doubt about that, because you don't see it. But <laughs> if I hold it up like this, then you see it, and then there's no more doubt that I have a magic marker in my hand. Unless somebody might think, ah, in his room he was planning to say that, and so he took just a piece of wood <laughs> dressed it up to look like a magic marker. <laughs> but if I write on the board with it, then you see it's a, a magic marker. Okay, so doubt means doubt about the Buddha, Dharma, the, the Aryan Sangha, and that's eliminated by seeing the truth of the teaching. 
Then the third feather is adherence, or maybe better, misapprehension or wrong grasp of the rules and observances. And this is generally formulated somewhat as in opposition to the ideas of many of the Brahmins and ascetics of the Buddha's time, that by practicing extreme, undertaking extreme ascetic practices, or just observing certain like fixed rules of behavior, one could achieve liberation. So in the Buddha's time, there were ascetics who would undertake rather strange types of practices, like fasting for weeks on end, or eating just a few grains of rice every day, nothing more, bathing in the river three times a day in the belief that they could wash off their impurities, um, subjecting themselves to the coming very close to blazing fire in order to sort of burn up their impurities, sleep going naked, sleeping out, exposing the body to the cold of the night during the cold season and so on. And so the Buddha taught that all of these practices are useless for attaining liberation. Okay, the fourth fetter is sensual desire that's desire or craving for any of the pleasures of the physical senses. And then the fifth fetter is ill will. This is anger, resentment, hatred, wishing the harm of others, wishing for harm to come to others. Okay, so these are the five lower fetters. And then Malankya Putta says, it is in this way that I remember the five lower fetters as taught by the Blessed One. Okay, what comes next, I have to say, I find a little bit puzzling. Okay, when Malankya Buddha says this, then the Buddha reproaches him and says, To whom do you remember my having taught these five lower fetters in that way? You know, it seems as if the Buddha is saying, you got it wrong, I've never taught the five lower fetters in that way. But in fact, he got it right. <laughs> Those are the five fetters that one finds mentioned again and again in the text. So why is the Buddha sort of scolding him or reproaching him? Anyway, let's just continue. Maybe I will make the explanation, the reason, a little clearer. Then the Buddha says, wouldn't the wanderers of other sects confute you with the simile of the infant, the little infant? Okay, so this is quite an interesting passage. He says, for a young, tender infant lying on his back does not even have the notion of identity or he doesn't have any idea of, I am somebody or something. You know, he's just a little infant. He doesn't think, I am form, I am feeling. He doesn't even have the notion of body, mind, feeling, perception, any of these. So how could identity view arise in him? Okay, now the Buddha brings in the main point. He says, yet, the underlying tendency to identity view lies within him. What's called here the underlying tendency, this in Pali is anusi, the word anusia. So the word anusia, it's made up of the prefix anu, which means something like along with or following, and saya, which means to lie, lying down. 
So anusaya is a mental affliction or a defilement which lies along with the stream of consciousness or it follows along with the stream of consciousness. It doesn't necessarily arise at any particular time, but whenever it meets a suitable condition, then it will arise. And so the Buddha is saying here that even in the case of the infant, who doesn't have any idea of maybe a very early stage of infancy, he doesn't even have a clear differentiation between himself and the world. But still, that tendency to identity view is lying within him. So as he gets older, reaches the age of reflection, the age of reason, then he'll start to ponder the question, who am I, what am I? And he'll start trying to figure out his personal identity. And then he might grasp one of the five aggregates and thinking, I am the body, I am feeling, I am perception, I am activi activities, I am consciousness. Okay, so he doesn't have the, even the notion of personal identity, and yet he has that tendency to identity view. And as he grows up, that tendency will begin to manifest. Okay, the young, tender infant lying on his back doesn't even have the notion, here the word used is Dhamma, which sometimes it means teaching, sometimes it means things in general. And so he doesn't even have any notion of Dhammas, probably teachings. So how could doubt about the teaching arise in him? Then the Buddha says, the underlying tendency to doubt lies within him. And so, again, as he matures, when he encounters different teachings, then he'll start to have doubts about them. Okay, then next, the young, tender infant lying on his back doesn't even have the notion, here the word used is sila, which is maybe translated rules or precepts. So how could adherence or the wrong grasp of rules and observances arise in him? Again, it's the underlying tendency towards adherence to rules and observances lies within him. Okay, next, the young, tender infant lying on his back doesn't even have the notion sensual pleasures, kame or kama. So how could sensual desire arise in him? Again, it's the underlying tendency to sensual desire is lying within him. Then as he matures and then comes into contact with sensory objects, that sensual desire will become active. So when he's, you know, if we see children, you know, they're attracted to bright objects. When they're able to speak, then they start saying, I want this, I want a new toy for my birthday, I want... All these things, iPod for my for Christmas. <laughs> I want a new iPad for my birthday. And then once they get older, <laughs> then the full sensual desire arises. And then it becomes very active. This is almost, maybe some psychologists have said, this is almost sort of anticipated Freud's idea about the sexual, sexual desire in children. You know, it just takes on different forms and then it's only when they reach maturity it reaches the full, full-fledged form of sexual desire. Okay, then the young, tender infant doesn't even have the notion of beings or other people. 
So how could ill will towards beings arise in him? So if he doesn't have the notion of other people, then he won't have ill will. But in fact, even little infants can get, sometimes they get cranky, don't they? <laughs> and upset and angry, even if they don't recognize other people. And then once they mature, then they'll start to form, to get angry with other people, to form. They have feelings of enmity, ill will, resentment. And so these anusias, or latent tendencies, are lying within even the little child. And as that child grows up, then those anusias come to manifestation. You know, when we have like, sometimes like really terrible people like Hitler or Idi Amin, former dictator of Uganda, or Pol Pot, former dictator of Cambodia. Excuse me? <laughs> <laughs> you know, this new defense authorization. <laughs> I have to be very careful what I say. But maybe when they were born, you know, as little babies, their parents looked at them and said, Oh, how cute, go, 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 go. And they would go, 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 go. And the parents would say, Oh, how adorable, how charming. Then when they grow up, they turn into terrible monsters. So where does all of those terrible drives come from? All along they're lying in in the mind and it's just sort of the interplay between their dispositions and outer conditions which bring them to manifestation. Okay, so the Buddha then winds up this passage which seems like it's spoken as a kind of refutation of Malakya or rejection of him. But in fact the five Lower fetters, as Malakya Buddha enumerated them, are exactly the way the Buddha has taught them on many occasions. The commentary gives an explanation, I think trying to justify this passage. What it says is that the Buddha spoke in this way because Malakya Buddha had a particular view or belief that the Sanyojanas the fetters exist only when they are occurring and when they're finished then they're completely gone. So he thought that when a person has sensual desire, that sensual desire sort of comes out of nowhere and when the person is finished with the sensual desire, the fetter is gone. When the person gets angry, then the fetter of ill will is occurring and then when the person calms down and becomes peaceful again, the fetter of ill will is gone. And so the Buddha spoke this in order to indicate that the fetter doesn't mean only the defilement in its active state, but also the underlying tendency towards that particular way of reaction. They're the momentary ones, but then what, are the, what is the underlying tendency in that? I believe the Anusya are mentioned in the Abhidharma, but this is, a, in a way, it's a whole problem. Yeah, but I think what you're hitting on is a problem in the Abhidharma system. The problem is that the Abhidharma, it's a little complicated, but it analyzes individual states of consciousness. And so then it will say that what defilements are present in a particular state of consciousness when it's occurring. But when that state is not occurring in the type of consciousness that intervenes between active states of consciousness is called the bhavanga. And it's said that the defilements are not present in the bhavanga. So it creates a little bit 
of a theoretical problem, then where are the defilements, where do they come from? And the commentaries give some explanation of that. They say that even in the Bhavanga, the defilements are not present, but what is always present is, they say, just a tendency for that defilement to arise when it meets the suitable conditions but it doesn't use the word anusya. It seems to be that if one tries to make theoretical frameworks too precise and too detailed, one gets into various conceptual tra traps. <laughs> oh, there was a question. But somebody says, the Buddha asks, in what way do you remember the lower fetters? But Malakya Futta doesn't really answer that question. He answers what they are, not what method he uses to remember them. No, because when the Buddha says, um, do you remember the lower fetters? And then he says, in what way do you remember them? He's not asking what is the method by which you remember them, but he just, he's asking, what are, what are the lower fetters that you remember? That's really the effect, of, the implication of his question. And so Malankya Buddha has answered his question. Okay, if an infant is a stream enterer, or became a stream enterer in a previous life, will he or she still have the three lower fetters as latent tendencies? And the answer to this is no. When the three lower fetters are eliminated, the latent tendencies, those latent tendencies are gone as well. And somebody asks, to which aggregate do the anusias belong? According to the Abhidhamma system of classification, they would belong to the aggregate of volitional formations the fourth aggregate of volitional activities. Okay, so now when the Buddha says this, then Venerable Ananda speaks up and he says, this is the time, blessed one, this is the time, sublime one, for the blessed one to teach the five lower fetters Having heard it from the Blessed One, the bhikkhus, the monks, will remember it. Okay, then Ananda, uh, the Buddha says, and listen, Ananda, take a time closely, I'll speak. And then the Buddha continues. And then he's going to speak by way of the distinction between the ordinary, ignorant, ordinary person and the instructed, noble disciple. Okay, so the uninstructed, ordinary person, who has no regard for the noble ones and so, so on, abides with a mind obsessed and enslaved or overwhelmed by identity view. And he does not understand, as it actually is, the escape from the arisen identity view. And when that identity view has become habitual and is uneradicated in him, it is a lower fetter. Okay, he abides with a mind obsessed and enslaved or overwhelmed by doubt, by wrong grasp of rules and observances, by sensual lust, by ill will, he does not understand as it actually is the escape from a risen ill will. And when that ill will has become habitual and is uneradicated in him, it is a lower fetter. Okay, let's go and sort of parse this passage. Okay, starting the untaught ordinary person abides with the mind obsessed and overwhelmed by identity view. Okay, 
Okay, so this implies now that for it to be a fetter, that the identity view has to be something that's active in the mind, something which is actually gain control of the mind. And he does not understand that as it actually is the escape from the arisen identity view. What is the escape from the arisen identity view? What is the way to overcome it when it's arisen? I would say that we distinguish two types of escape from each of these fetters. One would be a temporary escape and the other would be the permanent escape. So the temporary escape from identity view would probably be, you would say, like the clear understanding of the Buddha's teaching on and on anatta, on non-self. So if one has a clear understanding of non-self by studying the suttas, then one won't explicitly identify with any of the five aggregates. Even though there's still a kind of clinging to the five aggregates, but one doesn't form the view that this aggregate or that aggregate, this is myself. And then this temporary escape will be deepened through the practice of insight meditation. So as one gains deeper, as one contemplates the five aggregates with insight, seeing how the five aggregates, whether bodily form, feeling, perception, the mental activities and consciousness, how they're arising and passing away, then one sees that because they all arise and pass away, they can't be identified as self. And so based on both the wisdom, you can say the wisdom born of study, by studying the suttas, and reflecting upon them. And then by developing insight, one gains a temporary escape from identity view. Then what is the permanent escape from identity view? Some of you should be able to answer that. Abandon it? Abandon it. Well, abandoning is just a, a synonym. <coughs> Close, but more, something more precisely, a little more precise. Yeah, she said that correctly. Attainment of stream, stream entry. Because with the attainment of stream entry, one cuts off permanently the three lower fetters. Okay, so he doesn't understand as it actually is the escape from the arisen identity view. And then it's saying that when that view has become habitual, it seems there's actually two things here habitual and uneradicated in him, it is a lower fetter. But something can be uneradicated without being <laughs> habitual. No, it's true. <laughs> like, I don't think I get angry very often. <laughs> Occasionally, but not so often. But I wouldn't say that it's uneradicated in him. So I think maybe the 
translation is habitual, maybe it's not so satisfactory. I think the Pali is samudachinna. So I would just say, when the identity view, I'd say the more important term is that it's not eradicated in him, then it's the lower fetter. But also the earlier part seems to be saying that when the mind is obsessed and overwhelmed or overpowered by identity view, this seems to imply that for it to be a fetter, it has to be something which gains control of the mind. So maybe here the text is making a distinction between Samyojana, the fetter, as being the active form of the defilement, and the anusya as being the sort of latent or quiescent form of the defilement. Okay, the same is said in regard to each of the others. In the case of doubt, what would be the temporary escape from doubt? Usually the text would say by going to those who are learned in the text, asking questions, um, reflecting on what one has heard, trying to, to consult the text in order to clear up one's doubts. And then the permanent escape from doubt would be, what would be the permanent escape from doubt? Stream entry. Stream entry. Yeah, the attainment of stream entry. And then the same with adherence to rules and observances. The temporary escape doesn't mean that you give up rules and just behave any way that you want. But it means that with regard to precepts, that one observes them, but without this kind of tight, rigid mind, believing that just observing precepts is the way to liberation. But also in the Buddhist time, it probably meant not taking up these extreme practices of the outside ascetics and Brahmins. Sometimes this is translated as clinging to rites and rituals, which doesn't really seem to be the implication of the original expression, sila patta. But it might have included, maybe, it, perhaps it did include like the kinds of rituals that the Brahmins performed for purification. You know, it was a belief by the Brahmins that if you get defiled by unwholesome actions, what you do is go to the River Ganges, the sacred river, and bathe in it, and you can wash off your defilements. Or else you pay the Brahmins to perform a purification ritual for you, and then that will cleanse, cleanse your, your defilements or sins. Okay, then sensual lust. What is the temporary escape from sensual lust? Basically, it would be, that would be like one, but usually what the text mentioned as the antidote to sensual lust is the meditation on the nature of the body, especially reflection or examination of the 32 parts of the body. And then the permanent escape from sensual lust is what? No. Getting closer. <laughs> First jhana. Not permanent, no. Somebody said stream entry, I said no. Somebody said once return, or I said getting closer. Non return. Non return, right. <laughs> Okay, and then from ill will, the temporary escape is what? What? The temporary escape is? The temporary
temporary escape from ill will? Did, did you say something? No, it's a specific quality. Loving kindness. Yeah, metta or loving kindness. Excuse me? But it's especially the, lo the, lo the metta, the loving kindness. So that is the escape, the temporary escape from ill will. And the permanent escape from ill will is what? It's a non-return. So of the five lower fetters, there the five lower fetters are eliminated usually in two stages. At the first stage of enlightenment, first experience of awakening, this is the attainment of stream entry, the three, the first three fetters are eliminated permanently. So the stream enterer is one who sees the truth of the Dhamma. And by seeing the truth of the Dhamma, the stream enterer eliminates identity view because he's seen directly into the truth of non-self. He eliminates doubt because he's really seen the Dharma, so he has no doubt about the Buddha's enlightenment or about the truth of the, the essential truth of the teaching. And he knows that the Noble Eightfold Path is the way to liberation. So he gives up clinging or wrongly grasping rules and observances. But even the stream enterer can still have sensual desire and ill will. Okay, the next stage, the stage of once returner, doesn't eradicate any new fetters, but it weakens sensual desire and ill will. But it's at the third stage. So, okay, the once returner, the stream enterer and once returner are still, can still be reborn in the desire realm among the three realms of existence. They can still be reborn in the desire realm, not in the lower, lower worlds, but they can still be reborn in the human realm or in the heavenly realms. But when one makes the transition from the once returner to the non-returner, the decisive achievement is cutting off the fourth and fifth fetter. So non-returner cuts off all sensual craving, sensual desire, and cuts off ill will, anger, mental um, irritation. And so the non-returner then breaks free from the desire realm. So the non that's why he's called a non-returner, because he doesn't come back to the desire realm. But the non-returner can still be reborn in the form realm, or perhaps in the formless realms. Any questions now on what's covered so far? Uh, can a non-returner live a household life, be a CEO of Fortune 500? <laughs> <laughs> there's no more sensual lust and there's no point to, to acquire more materials. Definitely, non-returners can continue to live the household life. Whether they can be <laughs> a Fortune 500 CEO, that uh, I don't know. Um, I tend to be doubtful that they would be very efficient in that role. But it 
they would want to keep all of those responsibilities. Though it's quite possible that they can you know, continue to work quite efficiently at, at a job in, in society. But to be a, a CEO, often one has to be grasping for larger and larger salaries, special bonuses, be able to engage in cutthroat competition. So I don't think that a non-returner would have this, the temperament that would, suit, <laughs> would be suitable for such a role. He might just work at a you know, very well, easy-going, relaxed job, like maybe a <laughs> clerk in a post office or a bank teller. Perhaps the leader of PGR. <laughs> <laughs> It's better if you take the microphone so I can hear more easily. Do we have that? possible to achieve stream entry. I mean, in the Buddha's day, there are some records of people who just went to hear the Buddha teach, and just by listening to the Buddha's discourse, they achieved stream entry. But we have to understand that these were people who would have probably had wholesome roots, good roots, from many previous lives, and so their spiritual faculties were very mature. And so just when they heard the Buddha preach, then they could achieve stream entry, even higher stages, right on the spot. For, but for most ordinary people, the texts speak about four factors for achieving stream entry. The four qualities for achieving stream entry. Okay, the first is association with good persons. Sapurisa samseva. So associating with virtuous persons, especially in the Buddhist day, this would be associating with the Aryan people, those who have reached the stages of awakening. Okay, the second is hearing the truth, the good Dharma, Sadhamma Savana, so listening to discourses on the Dharma. Okay, then the third is Yoni So Manasikara, this is Uli Silve, I think. This is, um, we've proper reflection, wise reflection on the teachings. And then the fourth is practicing in accordance with the Dhamma. And that usually means, of course, observing precepts, and then practicing meditation and developing insight. And so, to gain stream entry, of course, one needs, normally one needs all four of these. And so if people are not actually practicing meditation, one shouldn't just you know, dismiss them and say that what they're doing is useless. Because they can be still acquiring good roots or building up wholesome qualities. But for the actual attainment, then generally one has to practice the meditation, especially the insight meditation, very intensively. What is the state of consciousness that enables permanent escape? Could it be right view plus right mindfulness plus right samadhi? Then 
Somebody says, John is the last of the Eightfold Path. I'm not quite sure of the question of the state of consciousness. The permanent escape comes from stream, the attainment of stream entry. Of course, that's a state of consciousness, but it's a state of consciousness in which all eight factors of the Noble Eightfold Path are present. Okay, I just I want to go on and take the next passage in the sutta. So this is now going to be expl explaining the opposite side about how there comes to be the abandoning of the five fetters. So this takes the case of the well-taught noble disciple who has regard for the noble ones and is skilled and disciplined in their dharma, who has regard for the good persons and is skilled and disciplined in their dharma. So this one does not abide with a mind obsessed and enslaved by identity view. And he understands as it actually is the escape from the arisen identity view. In identity view, together with the underlying tendency to it, is abandoned in him. Okay, then the same is repeated for doubt, for rules and observances, for sensual desire, and ill will. Okay, so now the person who's being taken as the example here is described as the well-taught or instructed noble disciple. And the text uses the word or term Arya Savaka. Now the word Arya Savaka should be understood doesn't necessarily mean a disciple who is an Aryan person, one who has reached one of the stages of awakening. But the word is used often in a more general sense to mean a disciple who is, let's say, has the Aryan tendency in his character the disciple who associates with the Aryans, the disciple who is practicing diligently, dedicated to the practice. And so the way this disciple is described is one who has regard or respect for noble ones, and one who goes to see the noble ones, to visit them, and one who is skilled in their Dharma, that is, who has a good understanding of their Dharma, and one who is well-disciplined in their dharma, that is, one who is engaged in the practice of their dharma. And so this person is one who has not yet eliminated identity view, but his mind is not obsessed and overpowered by this, and he understands as it actually is the escape from the arisen identity view. Okay, this much is describing the disciple who is still in training, the one who is still training to reach the Aryan stage. But then it says, and identity view, together with the underlying tendency to it, is abandoned in him. With that phrase, I think we have to understand that what is being brought in is the noble disciple who has reached this, one of the stages of the noble ones. In this case, with the identity view, it could be either stream enterer, once returner, or non-returner. Okay, so the same thing is said with regard to he does not abide with a mind obsessed and enslaved or overpowered by doubt, by clinging to rules and observances, by sensual lust, by ill will. So he understands 
as it actually is the escape from the arisen ill will. So up to that point it could be either the good person who's training to be a noble one or somebody who's already a noble one. But then with the next phrase, and ill will, together with the underlying tendency to it is abandoned in him, that is showing somebody who has reached the stage of the noble ones. And in the case of sensual lust and ill will, it's indicating which of the noble ones. Which stage of the noble ones? Exactly, non-returner. Because the non-returner is the one who has overcome the five, the five lower fetters. Okay, now I'll stop and ask whether there's any questions. I just noticed a question from the internet that I overlooked. <laughs> Is the desire for, <laughs> for knowledge, for example, scientific knowledge, or for electronic gadgets, considered a sensual <laughs> desire? <laughs> I don't think the desire for, say, scientific knowledge would be considered sensual desire. Usually a sensual desire is considered desire for enjoyment of the objects through the senses and with a mind which is soiled by the quality of sensual craving. The desire for electronic gadgets <laughs> I mean, I think it depends very largely on the attitude if one wants an electronic gadget, in a way, even the word gadget is a little biased, let us say, an electronic piece of electronic equipment because it's truly useful and helpful for one's work or study or communications. I, don't, I wouldn't say that that's an expression of central desire, but if one just has the craving always to be attracted to the new, the bright, the glittering, and wants to get more to out to others who have new pieces of electronic gadget, gadgetry. Um, and that, then I'd say it's a sensual desire. No. I, I just want to point out, it needs the gadget for, for my classmate to ask the question. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> which is the, um, the fetter. Okay, somebody asks, is the desire, <clears throat> is the desire to satisfy the first five senses all, sens all sensual desire? It's an interesting question. In 
it's a. I will say yes. Excuse me. I will say yes because I mean, sex is fine. Since you decide, it could be everything is a sense in terms of sex. Everything you sense is something because it's a feeling. Even when it comes to smell. It's good if you take the microphone. Based on the smell, say for example, perfumes or you know, yeah. really, the, the smell of a woman attraction, you know, towards a sexual desire. Yeah. I mean, the feeling towards, you know, the feeling, some of the feelings are not another uh, sexual desire. Mm -hmm. uh, then you go into, uh, say, uh, even when it comes to gossip, you know, speech, you know, when it comes, all of them are really related to sexual desire, aren't they? Mm -hmm. I would say so. No? I'm just thinking of a case of food. Of course, food is a strong object of desire or craving, but there's a kind of natural desire you know, to eat, which is necessary to sustain life. So even, I would imagine, even an arhat could will get hungry and desire to eat, but won't have a craving for taste. But aren't we always trying to eat something better? Isn't it, is it most people eat something that is always better? When I was at the meditation retreat, most people just quit because the food wasn't good. <laughs> most people just they quit. So they quit. They quit because the food wasn't good. <laughs> so that's the second decided. I was like, wow. It was like here. Yeah, it yeah, was here in this uh, meditation retreat. The last one I was here. Mm. But so actually, it was longer than was the thirty days. But most people just see food as so uh, attraction. I see it all the time. People say, oh, I don't like this. When they should just be eating it. You know, just to satisfy the, the body. Mm. Most people do that. I see it all the time. So these, these people cook better than the others. Say, no, it's because you like this food. The other people like the other one. It's just mm. different. Mm. So we tend to choose the side, the sensual yeah. desire, yeah. all the time. I mean, I see. It Anyways, time. let's say the sensual desire, or desire through the senses, is such a powerful force that. Yeah. One doesn't really have to answer the question whether the desire to satisfy everything through the senses is a sensual desire. Mm -hmm. I think right now there's more in education field. We use more sensual desire to educate children. Oh, really? The input. Audio, uh, audio tape. They what? They use visual input more, visual input. Yeah, but that might not be, sti maybe that's not stimulating sensual desire, but just it's just that students, I would assume, maybe they learn more easily when they grasp things in terms of pictures rather than just reading words. Yeah. And they encourage them to touch, like touch, sense the material. Right? They encourage you to, to touch. Yeah. Kids. Yeah. They learn how to form letter case by touching the sandpaper, the shape of sandpaper a bit. Mm -hmm. So it's use sense to, you know. Yeah, well, it's using the senses, but it's not necessarily provoking central desire. I think this one need to have uh, the notion of sensual pleasure in order for the sensual desire to arise. You know, maybe not. Maybe there are like sub, even like subconscious sensual desires. Well, even if a person doesn't have that concept, the still sensual desire would arise. I would think so too, yeah. Even in the infant, um, it has the craving for, say, the contact with the mother. Um, Again, like bright colors would be attractive to the infant. Did you have some other examples in mind? No, my question is just about the notion itself. Because one does not have to have certain notion in order for defilements to arise for him. Not even an infant. Yeah, I would say that that's the case. So maybe the Buddha's statement in this passage is a bit rhetorical, just sort of to drive home the point. 
And also he's, apparently he's quoting here what the outside wandering aesthetics would say, rather than presenting this as his own argument. Okay, we have to stop now because there's some special function today. And we won't, have the, we won't be able to have the discussion period after class because there's some special function for the volunteers, is that correct? Okay, so we'll end with the sharing of the merits. And then next week I'll have the class and we'll take, finish the sutta next week. Okay, so we we'll share the merit with the Devas, the Buddhas, the Dragon Spirits, wishing them to rejoice in the, our merits and protect ourselves, protect others, protect the world. Atasata Chabhumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyanta Nanamodipa Chirang Rakantu Sasana Akasa ta jaguma ta deva naga mahitika punyata manamodipa chiram rakantu desana. Akasa ta jaguma ta deva naga mahitika punyata manamodipa chiram rakantu manaparam. Eta vata cham hehis sampadam punya sampadam sabe de manamodantu. Sabha Sampati Siddhya Eta Vata Cham Hehi Sampadam Pundi Sampadam Sabe Bhutana Modantu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Eta Vata Cham Hehi Sampadam Pundi Sampadam Sabe Satana Modantu Sabha Sampati Siddhya Bhavagupadaya Vichyeta To Eta Ture Satakaya Upana Rupiya rupicha sanya sanina Dukha pamuchantu Pusantu nibutin Okay, so we end with three bows to the Buddha. Out of Bandai. They can change it, so just make sure it's, it's safe. Majma Nikaya, Paul 64. Oh, thank you so much. Oh, okay, I assume you, you know that. Yeah. So I just save it. Okay, and this, this I'm not 100% sure, but I think that is the case. This is the button. Yeah, you can put it there. Press it.